Praise the Lord for the faithfulness of our God. Thank you, team, for leading us in those songs. This morning, we are privileged to have our brother Jim Ikesty in our midst. And today, it is just another beautiful picture, for me at least, to see just the way God orchestrates our timing. The timing, our schedules, all of these different things. Today we didn't exactly know when we first planned this morning that we would be dedicating two precious young men back to the service of Christ Jesus, back to the glory of His kingdom amongst here on, here on earth and here amongst our family and our fellowship here. But today we're going to take a picture, we're going to get a look at what the faithfulness of God really looks at. So we've just dedicated two new little guys to Jesus and we're going to look at a patriarch of the faith today and see how God called him to the service of his kingdom. So, Brother Jim, if you would want to come this morning, we'd like to pray over you. The Bible tells us that all things, including you and me, including our brother here this morning, all, th yeah, you bet. all things were made through him, by him, and for him. And today, as we lifted up Ryder and Eli to Jesus, today we're going to visit an older gentleman <laughs> in his journey with Jesus yeah. and see how God is able to impact each and every one of our lives Amen. in beautiful and marvelous ways. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for the words of that song that reflect the truth of who you are. Amen. God, you are a good and loving Father. Faithful through all generations. Today, Lord Jesus, as we are opening up our Bibles now, just about to do that, God, I pray that you would help us to understand what it looks like to walk in the light of your glorious mission that you have called us to. Guide and direct my brother here today. May the spirit of your very presence rest upon him. The presence of your spirit rest upon him. And may your spirit lead and guide us. May no force of darkness have its way here this morning. In the name of Jesus, have your way. We love you. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> wow. My greetings. Am I on here? Greetings. Can you hear me? Okay. And, uh, and praise the Lord. I trust you have been worshiping God already today. And this is just an extension of that here this morning. But um, I've been working all week on, on this outline, trying to size it down to about 30 minutes or 40 minutes, because this is like maybe following the call, uh, preach to pastor to prison. That, that is, is hours of speaking on that and the stories that I would love to tell you about the call to preach, the call to pastor, and the call to prison. So what we're going to do is kind of ignore this outline a little bit. We're going to zero in on one section, and that's the call to prisons. And, uh, and I want to take you to that scripture, though, in Romans 8, 14, where we have those words in the scripture that says, for as many as are led. Now, we're going to be following the call. Following the call is being led. Okay. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Okay. It could say the other way around. It could say, if you're a son of God, then you will be led by the Spirit of God. And it would be all the same. But this is the way it says. So what we're saying, I think, is that God does lead. Amen. Amen. And his power is available to all of us. He does lead and guide. And this is some of the things I want to talk about here this morning is the leading of the Lord and how that has impacted me and uh, some of the experiences. And this will, this will go to, this will end up and with the act of God. This is going to end up with the glory of God being revealed, the glory of God coming down and proving his existence, his power, and his grace, and his strength. I mean, God is real. And this is what we're going to find out at the end of this message. God is real, he is big, he is powerful, and he is close by each one of us. And we're going to, we're going to prove that by some experiences that, that I've been through over the years. And uh, 
I think of these Gospel Echoes people over here and uh, their, their lives through uh, missions and uh, one thing of another and how that, uh, how that God works uh, in marvelous ways. And so let's remember that as God leads by his spirit, then we try to follow. And like I said, I'm working to get this down. But I want to give you a setting, first of all, that uh, gives you a picture of how God called me out of, of my setting to make a servant of God. Okay. So I'm going to draw a word picture, first of all. I want you to picture that you are looking over a sea of about 300 faces. You're standing on the platform. You're looking out over all these faces, okay? And they all look alike. All the guys that you see have white shirts and bib overalls on, okay? There's no difference. They all look the same. They comb their hair the same. They all even have the same kind of shoes, They don't have low shoes, they have high shoes. Because if you have low shoes, oh, well, you're kind of worldly a little bit. So they all have the same kind. They don't wear a belt because belts are wrong. So they have bib overalls. And if they wear a suit, they wear suspenders, not a belt. Belts are out. Belts are, are, are worldly. And so you're looking over these people, and this is what they look like. And they all look the same. And they all dress the same. And then over here you have like 150 guys that all look alike. But over here you have 150 ladies that all look alike. They all wear the same kind of covering. They all have the covering tied under their chin. They all comb their hair the same way. And they all have capes and aprons. And they all have solid color dresses. I'm not making fun of that. That's okay. It's okay to be separate from the world. I I promote that too. And so, but they all look the same. You wouldn't know that they weren't just all sisters to each other. I mean, you have this whole sea of faces here. I want you to get this picture. And you're looking out over about two or three hundred people that all look basically the same. And all of a sudden, you see something happening in the sky. First, you see a hand coming down out of the clouds, out of heaven. And then as it comes down to this sea of people, then pretty soon you see the arm of God. And then God reaches down into this sea of faces and he puts his hands on a young man and pulls him out of that surrounding and says, I'm going to make a servant of God out of you. I'm going to anoint you with the Holy Spirit and fill you with the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to make a missionary out of you, none of which you believe in. You don't believe in the anointing of the Holy Spirit. You don't believe in mission work. Your church doesn't promote mission work. But I'm I'm going to pull you out of here, and, and this is going to cost you everything. This is going to cost you everything in your church. I mean, it's going to cost your, it's going to cost your family, not, not my wife and children. It's going to cost my mother and my father. It's going to cost me my sisters and my brothers. It's going to cost me my respect. It's going to cost me my church. It's going to cost me everything. But I know that I don't have a qualified person, but I know that I have somebody who will do exactly what I tell him to do at any cost and every cost. So the only qualification that I had coming out of this setting, I didn't even have education. I didn't even have high school, just eighth grade. No college. College was wrong. High school was wrong. We only had eighth grade. So we have a a person who is not qualified in any way, particularly, to be a servant of the Most High God. But one quality this man has, and that is that he will do anything and everything that God asks him to do, and will do it at any cost, no matter what the cost is. I know he will obey my voice. Now this gives you a little bit of a picture. I'm, I'm going way back to following the call of God. That was the initial call of God. Now, I'm going to pass up the call to preach. Now, that was, that, that's a message in its own. That, that's a, that was a beautiful story. I'm going to pass up the call to pastor because that's going to take time. So I'm going to drop down to the call to prisons. And I'm going to hurry through this one and jam through this one as fast as I can. 
and try to get this done. But when I'm talking about giving up everything, I want you to look at Matthew chapter 19, verse 29. This is where you find this about giving up things for the kingdom of God. They're listed here. All of these I'm very, very conscious of. Very, very conscious of all of these are things that God has, has called me to give up. And I'm going to talk about some more of those things just a little bit later. But he says, everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my name's sake shall receive a hundredfold. Oh, and I just wish I had the time. <laughs> I wish I had the time to talk about the hundredfold here. But uh, that's not going to be, a, I'm not going to be able to get into that. But all I'm saying is there, there was a cost involved here because I was pulled out of my setting, which they thought was right, into the setting that God had for me when he called me into service. Enough said there. Enough said there about, about the initial call. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to fast forward for many years and skip a lot of stories and miracles for many years. I'm going to drop in here to the calls to prison. Now, this many years later, you're going to find me at the Sheridan Mennonite Church. You know where that is, some of you. I'm at the Sheridan Mennonite Church, and I am pastor of this church. I'm lead pastor of the Sheridan Mennonite Church, and I'm pastoring this church, a very nice church. I think we had about 120 people uh, were attending there, and uh, so, uh, some families uh, moving in, and, and it seemed like things were going okay at the church. I mean, you know, it seemed like they appreciated their pastor, and I appreciated them, you know, and things were going along. But all the time that I was there, I kept getting this, I don't like the word nagging because God doesn't nag people, but I've been getting this persistent call that I was cut out to preach to the lost. People that were out outside the church, were outside the fold, and were in, in the world. In fact, my call to preach to the lost was so strong that our church once a month would go to the rescue mission in Portland. Portland, Oregon, down at Skid Row, down in the slum district, was a rescue mission. And once a month, we would go down there, and I would get to preach some time to lost people. And I was so in, uh, infatuated with, with preaching to the lost that I just wanted to go there all the time because that's where God was calling me to go. Even though I was pastoring, that's fine, but God kept coming with this call, Jim, you are called to go out and preach to the lost, not really to the saved. And I, and I had a suspicion of this before I became a pastor, but it seemed like I was advised to go ahead and become the pastor there at Shared Mennonite Church. And so I just said, well, this is part of my journey, you know, this is part of the journey. But all along, I knew that God had cut me out to preach. To lost, to lost souls. But uh, as we went along, and then this call kept coming back to me more forcefully all the time. And I would just kind of brush it off. You know, well, Lord, you know, I don't want to tell anybody about this. I mean, uh, we're pastoring and we're doing fine and you, I'm doing the Lord's work right here. Don't bother me, Lord, with anything else. And I would kind of keep pushing it off and pushing it back until it got stronger Every time that God hit me with this thing, that there's a change coming, Jim, and you are going to be leaving the pastorate, and you're going to be called out to another ministry. What am I going to tell people? I mean, I, I don't even know where I'm going. And people are going to say, you're going to make a change. What are you going to do? I don't know. I don't know. God is just saying, there's a change coming, and you must obey what I tell you. If, it's like a test. If you think you have to know, then you're not, you're not obeying me. If you want to obey God, you'll make the move without knowing where God is taking you. In fact, I don't think Abraham knew where he was going either. The, the, God, God doesn't always tell us where we're going. Okay? So I didn't really know. You know, and this call came stronger and stronger and stronger till I couldn't stand it anymore. So I finally said something to our deacon about it. 
that God was calling me to make a, a major change in ministry here and that I would need to be replaced as the pastor of Sheridan Mennonite Church because God had another plan. He had another ministry for me. I don't know what it is, but there's another ministry coming. And so uh, it finally got around and finally got announced to the church that I was looking for a replacement there as pastor and because God was calling me into another type of ministry besides pastoring Sheridan Mennonite Church. Well, changing leadership in the Mennonite Church back in my day was a major, major step. I mean, it was like, it was like an act of Congress to try to bring in new leadership into the church. It was very, very difficult because these people didn't trust new leadership. They said, well, unless we know who this is and he's been preaching in our church for six or eight years, we don't trust anybody else. Well, I had been there. I had been preaching there for years before I was pastor because I was young, ordained as a young man. There was two older brethren that were preaching. And so by time we needed a replacement, our bishop had passed away and our other minister had a, a, a devastating st a stroke. And so they just asked me if I would step into the pastor position. And that was, that was fairly smooth because, like I said, I've been there. I, they knew me. They knew what was happening. They knew what I would say and what I would preach and what I believed. But now, it's not quite that easy for me to step out and bring in another leader at the Sheridan Mennonite Church. It was very difficult. Very, very difficult. It takes a lot of time and energy to do this. In fact, I think it was maybe even several years. But uh, there wasn't a younger man that I could just shift it off to very easily and step out of the leadership area there. And so... so with a lot of work and a lot of searching. Finally, the day came. Finally, the day came when I was, when I was relieved from that leadership position there at the church. And I don't think it was six months. I think it was just a few months later, once I had stepped down from that leadership position, it was only a few months till we got a call from Goshen, Indiana. From Gospel Echoes team, Goshen, Indiana. And they called our area and said, we're having a meeting in your area for all the churches that have an interest in prison ministry. They had an agenda, of course. And so we're inviting all that are interested to come to this meeting. We're going to have a meeting. So, so, the, so the people came from Gospel Echo's team, and they began to share what the need was on the West Coast. And they said, what we want on the West Coast, and we've tried to do this a number of times. It's never worked out. This is our last try. This is the last time we're going to do this. But we're looking for someone who could pick up the responsibility of the prison ministry on the West Coast. Because it is so far from Goshen that it was difficult to take care of literature, it would take difficult to get the grading for the literature done all the way in Goshen, Indiana, and they just really felt strongly that they needed somebody on the West Coast that could pick up the work. They were talking about what they needed. You know, and I'm sitting there under conviction, bam, 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 bam. My heart is just about busting out because I was under conviction. I knew what God was saying. But I wasn't going to say anybody, anything to anybody. So they had this meeting, and they, they spelled out what they were going to do and what they were looking for, and that they wondered if there's anybody there that would be willing to pick up this work on the West Coast. Nobody answered. In fact, I didn't answer either. But I knew I was called to do it, but I didn't answer. Why didn't I answer? Because I didn't believe you should. I, I was raised in a church where you don't get up and say, well, God called me to do this or that. that that's hofeadi. That's pride. You don't do that. You don't do stuff like that. You don't say anything. I said, God, if that's what you want me to do, then, then you work it out. I'm not going to get up here and volunteer to be that person. I just don't believe in doing that. And so, so anyway, they were going through the meeting and nobody was available to do this and they were about ready to give up I think and adjourn the meeting they said we tried this for I don't know how many times before it's never worked out this is the last try we're going to make to find somebody that will pick up and do this work 
and I'm going bam, 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 and I, I am looking for a door, I think, to get out of there. And uh, finally, before the meeting adjourned, some godly man stood up. I wish I knew who that was, and now I can't remember. Somebody stood up, and this is what he said. He said, God is telling me that the person you're looking for is in this meeting. Nobody had volunteered. Nobody was available. And he says, I, I, I believe that God is saying that person is here. Well, then, then the meeting got serious. And they began to ask people around the circle if they felt like God was leading them or asking them to serve on the West Coast as a prison director and as a prison assistant with literature. So now I am looking for the door because they're going around asking people this question and pretty soon it was my turn. They stuck their finger in my face, said, Jim, do you sense a call to this ministry? If I would have said no, it would have been a lie. If I would have said yes, it, it looked like I thought I was really somebody special. I didn't want to do that. So I just kind of guided between the lines. I said, I know one thing, I know God is calling me into a ministry of evangelism to the lost. I don't know where it is or when it is, but I do know that God is calling me into. Now, remember, I had already resigned because I didn't know where I was going. I already resigned, and now I was out here, and, uh, and they were asking, do you feel a call to this ministry? Well, pretty soon, here they come surrounded me and said, Jim, would, would you be willing to pray about this and see if maybe God would want you to come and serve in this way and talk it over with your family? Ellen wasn't even at the meeting. I was there by myself. She was at home. She was at home with the children. We had four small children at the time. So I'm there. I, I, I haven't even talked to her about it. I said, no, I'm not making a commitment. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to talk this over with the family. We're going to have to pray about it. And they said, okay, you go home and pray about it and talk to your family about it, and then you come back and give us an answer of what to do, what you're going to do. So anyway, long story short, I went home and I talked to Ellen, my wife, Ellen, in case some of you don't know who Ellen is, my wife, and because uh, I don't make a decision without her, you know, she's part of this. And so to my shocking surprise, Ellen didn't like any new ventures of any kind. She didn't like to be exposed to the public. She didn't like to be up front anywhere. She loved to serve the Lord, but not, not visibly. And to my surprise, she said, yes, maybe the Lord is calling us into this work. And so we start praying about this, and, uh, and it come together. It come together. And we responded back and said, yes, we said the Lord is calling us. In this ministry, we would be interested in, in moving ahead with this. Okay. Um, so here we are facing the ministry headquarters here in Goshen. And remember, I had said I'd, I'd given up everything, I thought, when I, when I answered the call back there at the church. And when we talked to Goshen, they said, now one thing I want you to know is we will not be supporting you. In other words, you're not a, you're not a, a servant or a, an employee of God's workers team in Goshen and we give you a salary to do this work. No, no. That's not the way we work. You will have to find your support in your own area. Your region that you are serving will be your support base. You will need to work up a support base. <laughs> boom, boom. Okay. Who's going to support this ministry, you know? It's, it's up to, uh, to us to find the support that we need for a prison ministry in the Northwest. And, and so, long story short, I went out and began to visit pastors and, and, and work on, on the possibility of doing a prison ministry out there. But long story short, one thing that us guys are guilty of, you're as bad as I am, we would like to do God's work with our own resources, 
You know what I mean? Yeah, we're, we're, we're glad to do the Lord's work, but we want to have sort of an income to kind of keep us going. And we're more than happy to do God's work, but we're, we're just hoping that somehow our assets will render us enough income that, you know, we can go out and do the Lord's work. You know what God said? Nothing doing. He said, you are not serving this ministry on your resources. That is out of the question. If, you, if you're going to serve the Lord in this ministry, God is your resource and he alone is your resource. Whoa, man, whoa. What do you mean? I'm, I'm giving up all of this yet besides all, all of the assets that I have. I'm giving up everything. He says to serve in this ministry, you will depend on God's resources and not your own. So some of you remember, I mean, I thought I had some resources. I really did. And I had some real estate, one thing or another, there in, in Oregon. And uh, some of you older people, some weren't born yet here, back in the 80s, in the early 80s, maybe 82, 83, 84, remember when there was an uh, economy crisis across the U.S.? I mean, it was, I mean, people were out of employment by the thousands. There was people unemployed all over, and Oregon was hurt probably more than most places because we are strictly a timber industry out there. And so hundreds, probably 80% of the people in Oregon make their living working somehow with the timber industry. All of a sudden, because of the interest rates, that stopped. There was no building anymore. So all the builders were unemployed. And so there was no more loggers needed out in the logging company. So all those people were unemployed. There was no more sawmill workers needed. That's where they cut up the lumber, uh, cut up the logs into lumber, because that was not needed anymore. And it just went, it just dominoed where everybody seemed to be out of work and out of, out of assets. And so how am I going to make a living? How am I going to make a living in this crisis? Because nobody is going to want to rent one of my apartments because they don't have a job. How can they pay rent if they don't have a job? And so I began to see that I was going to have to liquidate all my assets, everything. And I had, I had a beautiful home uh, on view property. I mean, it was on a hill where I could, see, I could see for miles across the valley, had a winding driveway coming up to my garage. It was a beautiful place, a beautiful setting. I built the house myself, and it was a nice situation. And then I had built a new duplex right in Sheridan, Oregon. It was a very nice duplex where two people can rent. Had some stone on the front. was very nice. And I had bought another duplex beside it and had it rented out. And so all of a sudden, I'm facing a crisis with all, with all my assets and my real estate. Remember what God said? You're not going to operate on your own resources. You're not going to do that, Jim. That's not the way you're going to operate. And so... Finally, I started selling off my properties just to get out from underneath them. So I would sell off a piece of property for less than it was worth because I want to get out from underneath it, so I would sell it. But I came out with zero. There was nothing left, nothing extra. I didn't owe anything, but I didn't make anything. So then I would sell off another piece of real estate. Same thing happened. Sold it for less than it was worth, came out with zero. You know, zero plus zero equals zero. That should have been the title of this message, really. Zero plus zero equals zero. And so finally it come down to my home. Oh, God, don't, don't take this away. Please, God, make a way for me to keep this real estate. This, this is where we live. This is our home. We don't want to part with this. But like I say, interest rates are not only double digit, they were 16 and 18 percent. If you think 7 percent is high, some of you weren't born yet. That was a tough, tough time. But anyway, make a long story short, I thought, boy, if there's just something I could do to save this place, I would sure like to save this place, Lord. What can I do to save my place where I live? I liquidated everything else and come up with zero, and I thought, well, there's one possibility. Oregon has a lot of canneries. And people raise vegetables and sell them to the cannery. And you can take a small acreage and make, and make some money on it. And I had about 15 acres on this place. 
It was a 50-acre piece of property, but I had about 15 that was tillable there. I said, oh, I worked and worked to get a contract from a cannery to raise cabbages. Thought, this is going to save my place. So I finally got the, finally got the uh, contract and, and bought the, got the land prepared for this cabbage field and got the cabbage plants, put a pump in the creek so I would have irrigation water, bought me a bunch of irrigation pipes. We didn't have circles. We just buy, get pipes and put them together and turn on the water. You know, this was our irrigation system that, back then. And it looked good. The cabbages looked nice. They were growing good. But when they were ready to harvest, the cabbage heads had cracked open. And the, and the cannery couldn't use them. So that was, that was real loss and began to see, yeah, God, what are you saying? Give up this place? Oh, I got another idea. I'd, I'd heard about this thing of raising shiitake mushrooms. You know what a shiitake mushroom is? Well, back then they were a really a, a gourmet mushroom. I mean, you found those only in the high up restaurants and they were worth a lot of money. Mushrooms. Uh, shiitake is what you called them. So I thought, okay, this is going to work for me. So I got all the information. I got the logs that were impregnated with this thing. And I, I built a structure with a cheesecloth over it and put a water system in it. And I thought, this may be the way to save this place. It didn't work. God didn't bless that. I don't know what happened, but it didn't work out. And so, so I remember the night at midnight when everybody in the house was asleep but me because I was probably worrying about my place. And I went out in the living room. Not only did I get down on my knees, I got down on my face probably weeping and surrendered our home to God very very difficult very very difficult but I knew God was taking everything that I had so that I would be totally dependent on him for the ministry that I was entering into so I surrendered that place sold it for less than it was worth came out with zero so now you got zero 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 and all that I had left after this surrender, I mean, going with my outline here, call to surrender, I'm already cleared down to the call of surrender here. Now I'm going, to, I'm going to talk about the act of God here in just a moment. But after I had given up everything, I, would, I had a two-door Chevy, not very new. It was, it was fairly old, but it was paid for. I didn't know anything on the Chevy. It was a two-door Chevy for a family of six. Got to think about this. I mean, you know, we think we've got to have a station wagon. We've got to have this. got to have that. I had a two-door Chevy, and I had four children. But that's all I had. I lived in a rented, we lived in a rented house. Because I didn't have a house anymore. I'd give up my house. I mean, that's pretty humbling for somebody that had his, has, has had own real estate and all of a sudden he is so poor that he can't even live in his own house. He has to rent a house. Zero plus zero equals zero. Now God said, now we're ready. Now we're ready for ministry. Now we're ready to go. And... Uh, Ah, oh, where am I at here? <clears throat> we were pretty poor at the time. We'd seen some hard times. God had said when he called me to the ministry that there would be some tough times, but I'll always be there for you when you need me. I will always be there to help you. So I'm down nothing, okay? And um, I'm working at a mobile home court where they have mobile homes, and it was owned by my father-in-law, and I was given the job 
I could work there, I could be the administrator there, and I could do all the repairs that needed to be done at this mobile home court. Yeah, okay. So I, I would get in a, a truck and I would go over there and, and work there pretty much all day. And, uh, and the people could come and talk to me about the problems they're having, and then I could do the repairs, etc. And so uh, one morning when I was ready to go to work, Ellen and I went down to the pickup truck together for me to leave for work. And bless her heart, she was there to bless me, I guess. And uh, I pulled my wallet out, and I said, pulled it open, I said, you know, there's no money in here. I think there's enough gas in the pickup to get me to work and back. But after that, I, I have no money. No money to put gas in the truck again. And so I guess we prayed about it. I'm sure we did. And uh, I got in the pickup truck and went to work. When I got to work, there was a mobile home in that court that had a water leak underneath the motor home, mobile home. And so there was kind of a pool of water where it had been leaking for a long time. And so I needed, of course, to find the leak, repair the leak, and take care of the problem. That was my job. I don't know how many men like to crawl underneath houses. I'm one that doesn't like to. It's kind of phobic in a way when you climb under a house. Much less if there's a pool of water underneath of it. But that's my job. i got to find this leak and fix it and repair it. Okay? So I have some waders that come up to about here to put on because there's water underneath this thing. I have a raincoat that probably comes down to here. And I have rubber boots and I have probably glo rubber gloves. I'm not sure what it amounted to that. And I started climbing underneath this mobile home to fix and repair the leak that was under there. I wasn't under there very long until I heard my name, Jim. I said, yeah. Jim, do you, do, do you like orange slice candies? Oh, yes. Yes, I do. In fact, matter of fact, I have some at home right now. But he said, do you like orange slice candy? I mean, this guy did not know me, nor did I know him, anything about him. All he knew is that I was Jim. Well, he said, would you come up to the kitchen, and we could sit at the table, and we could visit, and we'd have candy. Oh, no. I'm all dressed up in this wet clothes, and I, I'm supposed to come out for candy? I mean, come on, you know. But, you know, you don't say no to people like that. And so I climb back out from underneath this mobile home and, uh, and take off my rain clothes, my waders, my rubber boots, my gloves, and I go into the kitchen and sit down, and there on the table was a bowl of candy, orange slices. Okay, this is nice. And we visited and talked, and then I, I'm sure I finally said, you know, I, I still got work to do here underneath this, so I'm going to have to go back out there and, and get this done. So I go back out there, get the waders back on, and the raincoat back on, and the rubber boots back on, and get all ready, and I climb underneath this mobile home to fix this leak that's happening, because that's, that's costing that tenant, because the water is leaking. I'm not under there very long until... Jim, say, yeah, would you come out here? I I've got something for you. C come at well, if you'd come out, I got something for you. Oh, yeah, I just got under here. And so I come back out, take off the rain clothes and the waders and the rubber boots, and I go back into the house, and he has some money for me this time. And I don't remember if it was... $3 or $5 or something. And I said, don't give me your money. I mean, it looked like he was kind of poor. Maybe he needed it. I said, just keep your money. Don't give it to me. No, you have to take this because God wants you to have this. And so, make a long story short, I finished visiting, put the money in my pocket, and went back outside and put 
the waders back on and the raincoat back on and the rain boots back on, got all geared up and climbed underneath this mobile home to fix this water leak. Now, I know they're very long, and I hear, Jim. I said, yeah? Would you come out here? I, I've, got, I've got a $10 bill for you. If you'll come out and get it. I mean, I already knew what was happening. I mean, I was in tears because I knew God was taking care of our financial need to get to work. And so I said, uh, yes, I'll come out. And so I climbed back out from under and, and get the rain clothes off and the waders off and the boots off and all this and, and start talking to him and he gives me some money. And uh, I said, please don't give me your money. I mean, you probably need this money and, and don't give it to me, please. No, you have to take this money <laughs> because God told me to give it to you, so you have to take it. So uh, I gratefully, I guess, take it and put it in my wallet and go back out and get all dressed up for the water. I'm supposed to be repairing with the waders, the raincoat, the rain boot, or rubber boots, and all of this. And I go back underneath the house. I don't know they're very long. Jim. I said, yeah. Would you come out here? There's a $20 bill on the porch. If you come out here, you can have that $20 bill. Now I know what's happening. I am in tears because I know this is an act of God. God is taking care of Jim and Ellen. So I come back out. And I said, don't give me your money. You, you need this money. Don't give it to me. No, you have to take this money. You have to take this 20. That's for you. So I don't know how much I have by now. I have a 20 and a 10 <laughs> and probably a five or several ones or whatever in my wallet. And um, I don't know if I ever fixed the water leak. I guess I did. <laughs> I can't remember what I come from there, but I just know what God was doing. And why am I saying this? I'm saying this because I want you to know that God is real and that God is here and that God is still doing miracles. In fact, if you think those days of miracles are over, God forbid they're not over. They're happening still today. And if you have any doubt about God's existence, I want that finished. I want that sealed today. And if you have any doubts about him answering prayer, I want that Clear it up in your mind right here. God will take care of you. His miracles are still happening, and he still uh, takes care of us. How are we doing for time here? Not sure. But uh, make a long story short, I want to go back to the fact that, uh, you know, when God said you would give up everything, like in Matthew here, Chapter 19, he said, And everyone who has left houses, that's me, brothers or sisters, yes, my brothers or sisters were turning against me because of me being called out of their church to do something that they thought was probably wrong. Wife or children, I didn't have to give up my wife and children, thank God. But he says, or lands... That's all your financial properties. For my name's sake shall receive a hundredfold. Now what does that mean? Does that mean God is going to give back a hundredfold what you gave up? That's exactly what that means. In fact, God gave back two hundredfold. Everything that I had surrendered to God all has come back plus. Even my relationship, my family, my respect. And, and I'll tell you, I'll tell you uh, I can go back to that very same church and be called into the pulpit to preach. Where's the, where did the respect come from? I don't know. I don't know. God just restored everything. Everything that I'd given up, God restored a hundredfold or maybe two hundredfold. Whatever. But I want you to get that. I want you to get the fact that God's word is true. and you, It's either right or it's a lie. One or the other. 
He said, you will receive a hundredfold and inherit eternal life. Now, I probably read that before, and I thought, oh, yeah, you give up things, and boy, you're going to go to heaven, and God's going to bless you and go to heaven. No. He says, I'm going to restore those things a hundredfold and plus inherit eternal life. So God is, God is good. You were singing that song, uh, uh, Gene, leading that song about God is faithful. Whatever we were singing there, I thought about that. You know, God is faithful. I mean, he's faithful to the word. You can depend on the word because if you can't, then the whole Bible is of no avail whatsoever. If you can't, if you can't believe what God says, you might as well throw it out because God is true, his word is true, and God is faithful, and God is not stingy. I'm going to beat you out of something. No, that's not God. That's not, that's not what God is like. God said, I will supply your every need. I'm going to, I, I, I'm going to just finish this, and uh, I'm going to ask Jason to come up for a prayer here in just a minute. But... Uh, I want you to please understand uh, who God is and what he is doing. And and we've got a song coming up. We've got a a closing song coming up that talks about the miracles of God today. You know, I was sharing in a church not long ago about miracles. And a brother came up to me and said, you know what? Thanks for preaching on miracles. Because I just listened to a radio preacher who said there is no more miracles. And here's the reason there isn't any more miracles. And so I come and said, thanks for preaching on the miracles of God. You see what we're saying. Anyway, this beautiful song that was recorded by Mike and, and Debbie and their family talks about the miracles of God today. Brother Jason, you want? <clears throat> Wow. Praise the Lord, Jim. For your testimony, for your witness, for your example. Thank you for being someone that we can look to. There's not much more that can be said for the hand of God in the midst of a beautiful life that He's created and designed. But this morning, in our midst here, looking all around us, our faces, faces that God has designed and fashioned in his very own likeness, faces that are gifted with a heart and a soul, faces and hearts and souls that are called to walk in the light of our glorious creator. That's each and every one of us. Some are called to teach, some are called to preach, some are called to go into prisons, others are called to minister to the young and to the old. All of us have been given a great and marvelous task. We heard this morning that God doesn't always call the one who is perfectly equipped, but he always equips the one he calls. That's a faithful saying that we can take with us for the rest of our days. And when we're willing to surrender our hearts and everything that is within us to him and to his call, we find God's word telling us that at the end of the trail, even though Peter writes, we may be grieved with various trials along the route, if we are faithful to hold on to his hand and to surrender ourselves to that, he brings us to a place Where there is a reward that is imperishable, it is unfading, it is undefiled. Where Matthew writes, moth and rust cannot destroy. No thief can break in and steal. And 1 Peter chapter 1 says that it is God himself, God himself, who stands stands guard over that inheritance and reward that he has created for us to be part of. Friends, brothers and sisters, Ryder and Eli don't understand it just yet, but you guys do. So what will you do today? Surrendering your hearts fully and completely to him and to walk in the light of his glorious grace or to continue to be pricked, as Paul said, and to be prodded 
He's calling us. And brothers and sisters, in light of what we are about to embark on here at Living Hope Christian Fellowship in our body, in calling a brother to the role of associate pastor, this morning someone's heart here may be pounding out of their chest. Trust the testimony that you have been given. Our God is faithful. Would you all stand with me as we close in prayer? Team, you can come and lead us in that last number that Brother Jim has requested. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you that this morning through a voice of a man, a man that you've created in your very own image, we heard that the God of miracles is not dead. The God of miracles is not quiet. The God of miracles is still alive. He is still active. And today we rejoice in the blessed name of our Redeemer, Jesus Christ, the one who paves the way, the one who has opened the door of opportunity for us to walk into the light of those great and glorious promises that you have given to us, Heavenly Father. We thank you for your faithfulness and your commitment to your good work within us, that even though there are many in our audience, the one who speaks this morning right here in and of himself, that we back against, we push back against your plan for us. We say, ah, oh, surely not, Lord. Oh, surely not. But when our hands open up before you, oh, wow. The places you take us, the things you show us, and the person that you make us to be is amazing, phenomenal. So may you be glorified in us today as our hearts stand with a posture that is open before you. For the one who is here this morning that may be grasping tightly, may be not willing to let go just yet. God, would your spirit just reside upon them in a very special way. Cradle, cultivate, <laughs> nourish and direct that heart to a place where they can come to an openness before you and watch your good work unfold in their lives. We ask these things in the precious and marvelous name of Jesus. Amen. Lord bless you. Thank you for being